Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Javid Metz, and I'm in the Product Marketing Group at Contrast Security, and I'll be your moderator today. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Key Application Security Strategies for Your Cloud Migration. Before we dive into the presentation, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have a question at any time during this webinar, please use the Ask a Question tab located below the player. Your question will be addressed during the Q&A session at the very end of the presentation. Also, at the end of the webinar, please take a moment to rate this presentation and provide feedback using the Rate This tab below the player. And then finally, a recorded version of this presentation will be available using the same URL shortly following its conclusion. So feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. First, we have Rohit Gupta, the Global Account Leader at Amazon Web Services, AWS. We also have Sarag Patel, Chief Strategy Officer at Contrast Security. And both Rohit and Sarag will provide a backdrop on the shared responsibility model for security configurations in the cloud and how customers can control their own security policies. We'll also highlight the demands towards modern software security uh, models, enabling seamless DevOps workflows for your cloud migration. And then we'll put this theory into practice with real-world example and a case study with Chris Perkins, the senior principal security architect at a Fortune 500 medical device company. Chris will highlight the key issues that he and his company faced and the support strategies that allowed them to shift left and engage application security in cloud environments. So here's just a, a brief agenda again. And so with that, I will hand you over to Rohit. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Rohit with AWS. And I wanted to start by just telling everyone how we take uh, security extremely seriously at AWS. It, it is really job zero for us. Uh, it is the most important thing we do. Uh, and that is to protect customers and their data that is in the cloud. It is the foundation of our business, and, and so uh, we are working very, very closely with a, a variety of our partners, and you will hear from, from Contrast uh, right after me uh, on how they can help you do exactly that. So let's uh, look at what the issues uh, about uh, security in the cloud really are. Um, what we are finding is that most customers are trying to really move fast and yet stay secure in the cloud. And the challenges are that uh, it's really hard to do both things. And uh, you can use in the, in the, uh, historically, you had to do one or the other. You could either move fast or stay secure. And we believe the cloud allows you to do both. And the reason that it, it's possible is because of the foundation and infrastructure that's built into the platform. Uh, where you get to enjoy the, the security and compliance controls that are available in the platform. Uh, you have better visibility than is available just about anywhere else. Uh, very high standards for privacy and data security that are inherent to what we do every day. Um, and then couple that with automation, uh, which is really the way you can not only move fast but also stay secure. And then finally, uh, the, the largest network of security partners uh, and solutions that are available anywhere uh, are available on AWS. And like I said, you would hear from Contrast on how they can help you do that. So uh, what, the, what we have found is that with DevSecOps is one of the ways that customers are, are able to do both, move fast and stay secure. Uh, historically, uh, there were different groups of, of people responsible for different things. Um, you know, the business line owner, the development teams, the operations teams, uh, and the security team were all doing their own thing uh, and, and at various stages in the cycle. DevOps has attempted to, to combine some of those, uh, but we believe that, that security is a core component, and so DevSecOps is really the new model of, of being able to uh, move fast and stay secure, and it's particularly relevant in the cloud uh, where you have a lot of the benefits of automation and uh, platform capabilities that allow you to do that. So um, the way it used to be, uh, you had a traditional model, uh, some called it waterfall, where you did the design work up front, did a bunch of software development work, uh, and then essentially test and deploy. Uh, and so you really didn't have a, a great opportunity to, to iterate fast. And, and really to bake in security uh, until the very end, or at least test for it at the very end. 
they, they tried to move that faster with Agile. Uh, and, and then finally, with, with DevOps, as, as I mentioned earlier, where you were able to uh, do a lot more of the design along the way and continuously improve the output of, of what you were producing, both from a speed and a security point of view. But now we believe that there are a, a better way to do this um, is to actually uh, bring in security into every phase of the process. Uh, and that involves, um, you know, even starting at the very earliest stage of, of pre-commit, where you can actually do things like threat modeling and, and security testing, uh, perhaps even inside the IDE, code reviews, uh, and then the variety of other uh, important areas like uh, checking the build uh, to see if it will break when you're committing it, uh, compiling uh, and, and checking if uh, it passes all the tests that you want to do, doing source code analysis, uh, and, and so on. But really, the, the, the idea is that you are able to do security testing at every phase of the process. And what you get from that is a, a, a piece of code that comes out that is not only tested for security, but it works according to your specifications and is ready to deploy. And where we find ourselves is when customers are actually getting to deploy the code, they are responsible for securing it in the cloud. And there are a variety of things you've done along the way, as we discussed, to actually test the code and make sure that it is ready for deployment. But as we have found that our customers really do have a shared responsibility around protecting their infrastructure. So the code is just one part of what they need to do. Uh, at AWS, we pioneered the shared responsibility model for security, where we have defined uh, security off the cloud as something that we are responsible for at AWS, uh, and security in the cloud is what customers have to do uh, for their own uh, infrastructure. And, and AWS, of course, uh, takes security very seriously, as I mentioned earlier, and we have not only built the platform for scale, but for security and conforming to a large number of the standards that are available anywhere in the world. And you can see that list on the right side. Uh, so what you get from AWS is, is an extremely capable and secure platform for running your applications. But what you still need to do is all of the things that are in blue above uh, the, the orange layer. Uh, and there are a variety of things that, that um, are required to make sure that your application and infrastructure are indeed secure. And this is where we believe that uh, a lot of our uh, partners can help uh, deliver that level of security that you need to do for your infrastructure. And, and um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarag uh, from Contra Security to talk a little bit about uh, how they help customers secure applications and infrastructure in the cloud. Rohit, thank you very much. Um, I'm excited to kind of uh, walk folks through uh, how we think about cloud migration and partnering um, with platforms like AWS. Uh, you know, w w one thing I want to start with here is, is we, as we, um, as practitioners, think about cloud migration um, and the, the cloud environments and what that means for how we think about technology, one of the fundamental um, things is required is required us to think uh, differently about how we implement and how we deploy various types of security or performance or other types of capabilities in our software platforms. Um, one such, I think, fundamental shift that's really critical, certainly in the security realm, um, is this notion of uh, the, the demands being put on um, the need for a different model when it comes to cloud migration and, and, and cloud-centered um, applications. So, what, you know, one such uh, element is, you know, in a legacy world, in a, in a prior um, world, Many of the approaches we had around security, especially the application and software security, were very, were very scan and firewall um, based models, right? They are outside in, kind of bolt on types of approaches that had um, challenges, right? Things like, you know, being disruptive as part of your development process, your production deployment process, requiring a, um, a large um, manual and resource intensive effort, being snapshots in time. Um, all of which, which have challenged uh, you know, our ability to be able to migrate um, applications to the cloud effectively. W what we've seen and what we've learned is that um, you know, there's a need for a modern approach. And that modern approach is really um, 
fundamentally this, this idea of being embedded into the application, being embedded into what it is that you're, you're migrating into the cloud. So taking a more inside out kind of approach is saying, hey, if we can weave security um, into the application, then it allows us to do things fundamentally different. Um, things, for example, working within the flow that we have in terms of writing the software and the automation deployment and the, the management thereof of what's running in AWS, for example. Um, being able to scale up our, our capabilities and our practices such that we can um, really, uh, we, can, we can really uh, quickly migrate applications to the cloud and, and scale from there. And then finally, of course, being able to think about a singular um, uh, platform that will enable us throughout our CICD DevOps and or cloud migration um, practices. For many of you who've, who've been through this process um, and, and are familiar here, this may sound actually very familiar. You know, this, we had to go through a very similar exercise as we thought about performance you know, five or ten years ago when we were just really launching into um, uh, scale deployment in, in cloud, um, uh, cloud platforms and environments where you know, prior to rethinking the way that we managed and measured performance, there was a lot of effort around um, traditional approaches, which were basically, again, similar scanning source code to identify performance, potential performance flaws, or kind of doing one-off pings against your running application. Um, there's various tools that used to do that that would basically, you know, tell you how fast your application is responding maybe every five seconds when you ping it. And all of the, those um, traditional practices really were disruptive. They couldn't keep up with the cloud, and they didn't provide actionable data that allowed us to actually um, accelerate the, the, the cloud adoption and usage. And in the same way, in the same vein, in the performance uh, realm, you know, we, we shifted to an embedded model, right? Many of us use um, various tools, um, even things like AWS CloudWatch and others, that allow us to get embedded constant visibility into what is the performance and applicability of my cloud applications. And it gives us much more accurate and actionable data that allows us to scale um, our environments. So when we think about an embedded model, what's required, right? Um, there's several different elements here. We, we, you know, you would want, and for sake of simplicity and scalability, a singular platform that enables you from development through your CI/CD process and testing into production and deployment and management of your running applications. We need something that's, it, that doesn't require us to throw an army of people um, at, a, at any single problem, right? Being able to scale without having to con constantly scale people is very critical. Obviously, we want the highest integrity. We want a platform that's going to elevate our ability to be more secure, while also being able to enable us to accelerate shifts to the cloud. Um, we want things that are DevOps and cloud native, of course, because that's how we build software today. Um, and then we want uh, um, actionable data that's always on, right? If we can get constant data that's very actionable, that allows us to accelerate our processes. So how does this change um, the organization, right? At the end of the day, as we think about software security and application security visibility into our, our cloud applications, you know, everywhere from the executives, from the CIOs and the CISOs, um, being able to consistently get security layered in across their portfolio is very critical to them. Um, the security teams need to be able to give all applications consistent and a high level of security posture, right? Being able to um, provide a consistent and very um, advanced security control across all their applications is very critical. Development teams want to operate at DevOps speed. They want to deliver, they want to write software quickly, deliver it quickly, and they don't want security to get in the way. And that's important for us to be able to enable them to deliver that while still, of course, managing the integrity of what, what they're delivering. And then finally, the operations teams want to be able to keep this thing up and running in a very effective, performant way. And um, for them to do that without having to um, constantly um, um, respond to P0 um, vulnerabilities and issues enables them to be much more effective. So um, how does Contrast help? For, for those of you who may not be familiar with Contrast, um, we deliver really three kind of key capabilities um, across our platform. The first is what we call Contrast Assess. This is really a application security testing capability that combines static, dynamic, and interactive approaches to help you identify vulnerabilities in your custom code and libraries during development, during testing, during um, your CI/CD process. 
We also provide um, contrast kind of open source uh, security capabilities, um, also as a category known as SCA. This is about identifying open source weaknesses, so we, um, zero days of vulnerabilities that are in the open source libraries your applications are using, as well as being able to protect your applications from new zero days that may uh, threaten those components that your teams are leveraging. And then finally, we provide a, a, what we call Contrast Protect, which is a RAS runtime application self-protection product, um, which is about helping you see and stop um, attacks and exploits that are happening against your running applications in the cloud. Um, all of that's delivered um, by this uh, technique called instrumentation, where we weave in security sensors into your application throughout that entire process. So, um, uh, you know, one last slide here to kind of summarize how this all works. You know, um, in the top left, you see this notion of where Contrast can instrument the application to add these sensors into the process. Then your applications, as they're in the development process, as they're in your CI/CD process, or, or as they go into uh, production in AWS, have that sensors built in that are constantly feeding information back to the, con the, the Contrast security platform. Um, on that platform, we are providing those three capabilities I just referenced. And the results that we're finding, meaning if it's data around a new vulnerability found in your custom code, or a, or a zero day, or a vulnerability that's um, in the open source library you're using, or a new attack in your production um, application instance, um, that data is being fed right back into the systems and tools that the teams use today already to be able to make it very actionable um, and addressable in a very um, quick way. So with that, um, I, I wanted to... Um, uh, with that summary of the practices and, and the background from AWS and Contrast, I wanted to hand it off um, so that we can hear about how we turn this theory into really a real-life use case and some best practices. For that, I'll hand it off to Chris Perkins, Senior Principal Security Architect at a Fortune 500 medical device manufacturer. Thanks, Rog. So I really appreciate the time um, just to talk about this stuff. It's very, uh, very uh, valuable information, and frankly, both AWS and Contrast has allowed us to meet the needs of our business um, by uh, getting to the speed that they need to be at. But one of the first things I'd like to cover is, you know, typically we have our, our standard development process that Rohit had mentioned about earlier in your waterfall or agile methodology. Well, typically the security teams come in at the very end of that phase, whether it's uh, in your waterfall phase at the very end before production release or in Agile, frankly what happens is that your security items become backlogged and then, then uh, they just get uh, continue to be backlogged as functionality continues to get added into your build. And so in essence, uh, you have a sprint or a couple sprints at the end of the project to tackle your security items. The challenge with that, um, obviously is that it causes a lot of unplanned work and more importantly from the uh, business perspective is it costs a lot of extra money to solve those problems later on in the environment because you have to go back through and redo testing and change code and do a lot of different um, processes uh, over again to solve the problems that if you had caught it earlier in the process would be just a simple code fix uh, right before a quick build. So when we were looking for opportunities to help improve our business units, we kind of were looking for three key strategies that we would need that the, the, for the opportunities to help us out. The most important one for our industry and is quality, right? In the medical device field, um, there is no thing higher than quality. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we are shifting our security conversations left, uh, similar to what we've been doing for many, many years is baking in quality into every step of our, our processes. We wanted to do the same thing with security. Uh, and then finally, you know, we want to make sure that we are able to in, extend and enhance the security foundation of all of our environments, uh, not just at the application tier. And so really, you know, the bottom line is that we wanted to be able to help our business units um, enable safer speed um, and growth to the market by providing them the ability to have a increased innovation, right? Being able to go through this process, accelerate their development life cycles, really helps them get through the, the iterations needed to uh, get to the, the business values of their, of their organization. The other nice benefit of moving to a, a cloud platform such as AWS 
is uh, as uh, Rohit had mentioned, there's that uh, shared environment. Well, you also have a standardized infrastructure at that point. If you're using a lot of these infrastructure as code techniques, you no longer have to worry as much about your uh, underlying hardware uh, installation drift in your environment. You can make sure that all of your environments are exactly the same, which is, adds a lot of value and, and provides a lot of speed. Uh, key points there are that you don't have to uh, have your uh, testing environment look different than your production environment looks different than your development environment. It can have a very uh, vanilla look and feel to it. And then, of course, right, develop, uh, reducing those development costs. The earlier in the life cycle you can get in the process to solve or to find these issues, the earlier in your life cycle you can solve them, uh, and it becomes less of a pain point. So for us, from our legacy environment, you know, as we were looking to move into the cloud space and take advantage of some of the new capabilities, we really needed to start in what we call kind of a lift and shift uh, environment. We, have, uh, we had some very valuable business applications that frankly were very antiquated um, and you know, had typical problems of they're, they're very valuable to the business, but we can't do anything to the environment because frankly no one knows all the details around uh, the application and, and we can't let it crash. Um, causing the issues. So by providing uh, both the, the build process uh, in AWS as well as using contrast, we're actually able to get a highly accurate uh, analysis of the existing code base to see what vulnerabilities may exist in that legacy software. You know, a lot of times we have environments that uh, where we have these standing applications and frankly there may not even be a development team left anymore. Um, and so if there is a development team, they're obviously going to want to know what their priorities are to tackle these things. And so very quickly, we can get that vulnerability done uh, just by installing the contrast agent in our environment during our process. In addition to that, we also can find uh, through the software composition or SCA component that uh, Sarag had mentioned earlier, we can very quickly prioritize the upgrade processes of the underlying libraries and code bases that the, the application is using um, to make sure that we're not having any vulnerabilities in there. But one another another benefits of that technology is we actually get to see uh, a way to help provide a lot of more efficiencies to the application simply by removing some of that quote unquote code bloat. Uh, you know, so with that with the software composition analysis, we are able to see that it's got vulnerabilities, but we're also able to see the number of DLLs and different components, different library components that are actually being loaded in a new environment uh, and allow us to remove all of those unnecessary components, uh, both to help secure us more and also to help make the, the application run a lot more efficiently. And then finally, from the lift and shift perspective, uh, it, another pain point that we ran into is that we didn't necessarily have the visibility downstream of uh, databases and other uh, application hooks that the application may need to, to keep moving or may be providing to others downstream. And by using the uh, contrast agent, we get an automatic software architecture that actually provides those downstream connections uh, very quickly for us and so that we know that we're capturing all of the upstream and downstream impact so that when we actually do the lift and shift, we're making sure that we're lifting and shifting all of the appropriate pieces uh, in conjunction rather than decoupling, decoupling things and breaking, breaking some processes. So in addition to the lift and shift side of just simply moving the applications over and providing that visibility, it also provides us out of the box protections, which again is very valuable in the lift and shift environment for the legacy applications that may or may not have resources uh, funded or dedicated to mitigating some of the vulnerabilities in the actual code base. And so the way that we've taken advantage of that is um, with the contrast tool, there's actually CVE shields or out of the box shields for all of those legacy applications that have known vulnerabilities in their libraries and frankly in some instances won't be able to upgrade without doing a complete rewrite of the application. Well, we can continue to let the business move forward with their critical applications by providing these protections out of the gate. And in addition to that, we can um, take advantage of the out-of-the-box uh, protection rules for a whole class of uh, attacks, like your injection attacks, your cross-site scripting attacks, as well as zero days. And, and why this is very valuable 
is a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, again, we know that legacy applications uh, that have been stagnant likely will have vulnerabilities, even if they were released in the best uh, best uh, status as possible, just because over time new vulnerabilities are found. This provides that protection out of the gate for us to really let the, the business unit move forward. And in addition to that, it brings the uh, standard WAF approaches, or for those who aren't familiar, your web application firewall uh, protections all the way down to the actual application layer so that it can travel with the application rather than having to rely on an, an, an ingress point for that, uh, that activity and, and hope that it's being covered at a higher level in the stack. In addition to that, we also have the ability to apply virtual patches um, and also apply logs to these legacy applications that, again, may not have any uh, resources dedicated to do any changes or to provide additional uh, coding to fix issues or to provide logs that are necessary uh, you know, in the new modern world. Finally, oh, another one of the, the great features is we actually can reduce a lot of the network noise simply by enabling the, the bot blocker functionality in the protect portion of contrast. And what this does is it automatically blocks bots and scanners from reaching our application. So again, we can really just look at the traffic that's important to us and eliminate all of the noise simply just by installing the agent and letting it run. So really big value to our legacy applications as we move into a more, more modern computing environment. So back to the, uh, you know, the standard developer versus operations uh, problem, right? Uh, you know, this is a little bit of a joke, but we do see this uh, in, in certain areas where you may have a standalone development team <clears throat> that uh, works on an application, develops it, develops it, works great in their staging and testing environment. They hand it off to the operations folks, <clears throat> excuse me, and then problems start to happen. You know, this is why folks have uh, things like hypercare concepts in their release cycles and other items like that. We want to make sure that we're trying to avoid those types of issues. And so the way that we do that, and Rohit had uh, hinted at this earlier on in the process, is through the concepts of DevOps or DevSecOps. We've actually taken that concept and built out uh, uh, what's called an application security or AppSec pipeline that works in conjunction with the DevOps and the DevSecOps models. Some of the key things to think about when you're looking at these types of application pipeline processes is that you're really trying to optimize the critical resources, which are your human capital, your application security personnel and your development personnel. You know, we'll never be able to hire our way out of any gaps there. The only way we're going to be able to move forward and uh, help enable the businesses is to automate the things that we can automate that don't require the human brain so that we can really drive up the consistency of how things are happening, um, really increase the visibility and metrics so that you, we can do a, a full life cycle and fix problems out of the gate, and really increase that, that tracking of the work status. Right? We want to make sure that we, we provide the visibility across all the platforms so that we can start building out the uh, efficiencies into the different programs. And then finally, uh, you know, this goes without saying, but it is a, a cultural problem that we see in many environments. Um, you know, there's a, almost a built-in natural friction between the application security team and a development organization um, for a variety of reasons, but um, one of the key ones that we've saw, seen in our environment is that because we do historically come in late in their development life cycle, uh, we just become, in essence, the bad cops and uh, provide a block to their release. And we want to we work in conjunction with developers, not um, be roadblocks with folks. So again, some of the key features of an application security pipeline that um, is important to think about is that you're never going to get to speed out of the gate just by saying you have a pipeline. The real, the real key points are that you make sure that you're designing it to have iterative improvement and that you, you're taking in those true agile concepts into even the security side of the house, right? That we're doing just one-way flows, well-defined states, and as we improve things or see things that need to be improved, we actually write automations into that process. Um, and, and again, we want to make sure that we're partnering closely with the development team so that we're not building out a separate process that they need to engage in outside of their normal cycles, that it works lockstep with the types of work that they're typically doing. 
So out in the uh, environment, there are some really great examples. For those who aren't familiar with OAuth, um, definitely go check out. It's a great uh, open source public um, repository of excellent security information for um, applications, especially in the, the web space, but also within the mobile, mobile space and, uh, and frankly anywhere that applications are designed. Um, they do have a really great uh, generic framework that I wanted to highlight because we built our, uh, our pipeline off of theirs. So in essence, what you see here is it basically takes that concept of working uh, left to right from an intake, triage, test, and deliver position uh, and basically wraps all of that back together into a continuous uh, feedback loop. Um, there's a variety of different ways you can do that. Uh, you know, obviously from a security tooling perspective, we've landed on contrast because of the integrations and the seamless nature of how it can work with our pipelines, uh, but, you know, tool agnostic here, right? The key is that you are actually doing a flow, and it's very important to have this flow here in place, uh, it's something to work off of, a framework to work off of, because it gives you that, those, those guideposts to move forward with. So. From our perspective, you know, we, we knew that we were never going to be able to get to go fast right away, but we knew that we had some challenges that we wanted to solve uh, for our businesses uh, quickly. And really, this is, this is kind of the underlying meat and potatoes of the conversation, right? The keys are start with your manual stages um, and then document those numbers so that you have, when you have the conversations with leadership, that you have direct metrics to show how you are actually improving the automation. You want to make sure you're taking advantage of all of the webhooks that these various tools apply, uh, uh, give you access to, both contrast as well as uh, Amazon within their Lambda environments, um, and, and make sure that you're actually using these hooks to drive your, your processes forward based on event-based de decision making. Right? The key there is you, you can automate past fails based on an event coming out of these tools. So as an example, our workflow goes a little bit like this. We have a request come in through uh, one of our sources, uh, and then we enable uh, as assess, contrast assess in, the, in that environment. Um, and then it moves over into our kind of our triage and test stages where we can immediately get the results of the composition scan to know what our vulnerable libraries are out of the gate before, before even exercising the application uh, and start that fixed cycle right away there, uh, and then it moves on and, and really works in parallel with the developer's functional testing process. So as the functional tests run for the developers, we automatically get the contrast results uh, in parallel with that because it's watching those functional tests. We don't need to do a separate contrast run to make sure that we're getting the information. It works in parallel and seamless with it. So again, we can return those results back to the developers directly back into their bug tracking utilities uh, or their code repositories or however they want to do it, uh, even all the way back to their IDE levels if they've got it installed at that point. And again, just continue along with the same pathway that the development process typically takes. As you go, they go into your user acceptance and your quality assurance runs, we can actually do some checks against contrast and the routing capability visibility to make sure that there's no gaps both in a security coverage perspective, but also, more importantly, from a user acceptance and a QA perspective. We can actually validate that the user acceptance UAT testing is completing a full comprehensive test of the application by leveraging the contrast visibility of the application. And then, of course, finally, before you actually push out to a production or de delivery environment, um, you can actually give a go no-go based on the type of vulnerabilities that may or may not still exist in your code base, and finally enable that protection so that if you do have, let's say, a medium or high vulnerability that needs to move forward because of business criticality, you can know that you've got protections uh, and mitigations in place uh, while the development process works in the background to fix those problems, but yet still allow you to move forward. So just a couple key takeaways uh, and recommendations that uh, I would uh, like to, to give everybody based on some of the, the, the items that uh, we went through. So one of the big and most important parts is just make sure you include your, your agent and its associated YAML files directly into your AWS CloudFormation or other build templates, right, other build scripts. So that for every application, every build that happens, 
you've got the agent uh, and the visibility installed, even if you don't necessarily use all the functions, it's already pre-built into your process, and so it's, at that point it's automated and you don't need to think about the next step. Finally, or excuse me, Max, what I want to make sure is that you enable that uh, protect monitor mode during your user acceptance testing. Uh, and so for those who aren't familiar, uh, Contrast provides the ability to have a, both a protection and, and a, uh, excuse me, both a block and a monitor in the protection portfolio. What's nice about this is that during a user acceptance testing, you can actually watch for any false positives that may come up uh, during the process. and build out your exceptions in an automated fashion prior to, to moving to production so that you know in a production environment you, you don't have any false positives. This is really important, especially to those folks who have had experience in the web application firewall realms or other um, application security services. The false positive rate can be very challenging and frankly can be um, a hindrance to a lot of folks moving forward. This really gives us a, a way to automate the process and solve those issues prior to even getting to a production state. <clears throat> After the UAT, of course, you want to switch the, the uh, protect into your block mode, and that way you know it's kind of a set it and forget it stage, right? You're, once the application moves to your production environment, you know that you're being protected for active attacks out of the gate um, with your zero day, or excuse me, with your uh, false positives already removed uh, during your uh, user acceptance phases. Another important piece here is to make sure that uh, see if you can get your developers to connect the tools into their IDEs and their bug trackers to help, in, help create that automation and help in, improve the efficiencies of the developers and fix the problems earlier on in the life cycle. And then finally, if you're not <clears throat> familiar excuse me, with AWS Lambda and other pipeline tooling or CSD functions, you know, spend some time researching these items. Amazon's got some really great tools out there that can really help speed up your processes and really drive you towards an, an event-based uh, pipeline delivery process. Uh, so just wanted to, to throw that out there. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll throw it back to Sirag for some final comments. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, one uh, additional piece I want to add kind of briefly is, you know, from working with um, several hundred customers, um, a couple other learnings in, in line with and in addition to Chris's recommendations. Um, one that we've heard several times is the notion of leveraging kind of the unified security approach from development through production, from um, development through your AWS kind of deployment to enable you to achieve higher security, but also the, the speed aspect that Chris was mentioning is critical, right? So, you know, one such example we've seen is when you have compensating controls in place um, and policies, you can do some pretty creative things. You know, th these are just examples. Every enterprise will have their own policies. But one thing that we've heard um, that, that was very effective is um, enterprises that, that say, hey, look, when we identify a critical vulnerability, for example, during the software uh, development or testing process, um, that critical vulnerability obviously must be addressed before the software is deployed. Great. Now, if we have the compensating control in place um, where we are able to prove that we have the protection capabilities for that vulnerability, we will, as a security team, consider that a medium risk vulnerability, which may have a different SLA in terms of how soon it has to be remediated prior to software deployment, um, that may allow us to, de to deploy the software today, but give us you know, a day or two days or two weeks, depending on the policy, to remediate that problem. Um, so that we don't have to rely upon the compensating protection control that's in place. Again, that's just one example, but those are some of the interesting you can do, uh, interesting elements you can do when you think about having a platform that can both tell you vulnerabilities and protect you from an attack. Um, similarly, we've seen so similar policies around kind of new zero-day vulnerabilities. Right today, if a brand new zero-day vulnerability is is um, uh, published in an open source library that your application may leverage, you know, the, the primary course of action is to immediately, you know, raise a red flag, stop the application, go back to development, have them work on a fix, and retest and redeploy that application, all of which is essentially, you know, stopping business. Um, and so, you know, we've seen companies think about how they can update that policy given the compensating controls they may have in place. The second one is, is very much in line with, with uh, a recommendation Chris gave is, you know, we've seen in large enterprises um, that they generally will have some kind of center of excellence around either the AWS cloud migration, for example, or 
a DevOps program or maybe a microservices or container-driven architecture. Um, and <clears throat> one way to kind of simplify and accelerate the, the weaving of security into an entire process is by working with partners there. You know, weaving in, like, like Chris mentioned earlier, the agent or the YAML configuration files into a standardized Docker image or into your AWS CloudFormation scripts will enable you to kind of just at one point do a quote-unquote integration or deployment and then you can expect to see it everywhere that might get used, which is already being used um, kind of um, widely across the organization. So with that, um, I, I, I wanted to kind of quickly recap um, some of the elements we went through today. You know, first and foremost, obviously, the AWS shared security model is really critical um, to understand when migrating workloads to AWS. AWS focuses on the, providing the security of the cloud, while um, customers are required to own security of what's in the cloud. Second, application security is obviously a very critical element of protecting your most valuable assets that are running in the cloud. Um, identifying vulnerabilities earlier and protecting what you deploy provides some of the core requirements and capabilities you need to truly enable a DevSecOps sec program. Um, to effectively achieve this in, in current and modern software really requires this notion of an embedded model, right? Rethinking the way that we weave security in um, that will be a more native fit into a cloud migration strategy and, and really be similar to how performance is managed today. Finally, crawl, walk, run, and then fly, right? It's important to take steps towards automation and constantly improving and advancing your processes. Um, metrics and automation is paramount and allows the seamless acceleration of the increased security um, uh, of your cloud migration efforts, right? So it's not just about acceleration, but we obviously want to be even more secure than we were before. So achieving both of those is really critical. Um, so, you know, with that, uh, obviously, to learn more, um, you can visit uh, the AWS presence at aws.com slash security. You can also embed security into your projects today by leveraging um, the Contrast Community Edition capability. You can see that at contrastsecurity.com slash CE. And finally, you know, meet both of us um, at the, the upcoming new AWS Reinforced Conference. That's June 25th and 26th. Details of that you can find at reinforce.awsevents.com. Thank you all for your time today. Uh, we're really looking forward to some of the questions we'll, we'll receive in the open Q&A. With that, I'll hand it back off to Jawed. Thanks very much, Sarak. So let's have a look at the uh, Q&A from the audience. Okay, then. Let's look at some of the questions from the audience. Um, First question, why is security in the cloud different than in my own infrastructure? Isn't it the same code that is running? Rohit, that's probably for you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, security in the cloud is, is different because it actually benefits from a lot of the underlying capabilities that the platform, in this case AWS, uh, automatically provide. And so you can actually build on and not have to start from scratch. And that's really what I talked about earlier in the shared responsibility model. Um, uh, but it, it, there are benefits that you get from the automation that's available, the visibility that's available, uh, and the ability to take action in an automation in an automated way to stop something that that may be uh, leaking data uh, are some of the differences that you get uh, by being in the cloud. Uh, just. Just to add on to that, it says, uh, next question says, you talk about shared responsibility. I thought one of the reasons to move to the cloud was to hand off security to the cloud provider. Why can't you take care of that for me? Yes, that's a good question. And I think that uh, people sort of uh, assume that the, that the cloud provider, in this case AWS, uh, would be responsible for all the security of the application. And uh, we cannot secure what we don't know. Your application is something that, that uh, and your data is really in your domain. And, and we do what we can to secure uh, all elements of the cloud, uh, definitely our own piece of it, which is what I called earlier the security of the cloud. Uh, but your application running inside your uh, AWS account uh, and the data that is part of that is something that you have to secure. And we provide a lot of resources uh, to help you do that, and, and some of our partners uh, help there as well. Uh, but really the responsibility of securing your application and the data that is part of your application 
is the customer's responsibility. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question. As companies migrate from on-prem to hybrid to cloud, does a solution like Contrast work in these environments? Sorry. Uh, good question. So um, that's actually central to one of the points we discussed earlier about this, this modern software requiring an em embedded model, right? Um, uh, approaches like Contrast, and there's others out there that, that take this approach of embedding security into the application, um, mean that the security goes wherever the application goes. So as you're shifting your workloads into AWS, um, obviously, you've got the, the assessment of vulnerability capabilities and the protection capabilities built in, but the same exact principles and same platform can also apply to the workloads that are still in your data centers, that you're in the process of shifting over. And so uh, another kind of side benefit, another key benefit of this embedded model is, is um, the security is built into the application wherever it may live at that point in time. So if it's still on-premise a data center, fine. As it's shifting or as it moves to AWS, um, the same platform, the same capabilities will also help you there. And so, um, that, again, that's really central to this notion of modern software requiring an embedded model. Okay, thank you. Next question. I think, Chris, this is for you. How has this, improve, how has this improved relationship between the dev and ops teams at your company helped with your migration to the cloud? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it, it's a kind of a nuanced answer, but really it, it's helped the relationship significantly because it's removed some of the, the historical pain points that the development team has had with some of our security folks, right? Um, because historically some of the tools are static and your dynamic scanning tools have a lot of uh, false positives and or just a lot of communication that needs to happen back and forth between the teams. With this tool, we actually are able to provide uh, active and valid in actionable, excuse me, information to the developers directly out of the tool into their own tool sets, which is another key piece. We're meeting them um, where they work rather than having to go somewhere else uh, in their in their processes. So it's definitely starting to improve the relationships um, for those teams that are embracing it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question um, is AWS. HITRA certified? If so, what is the scope of the certification? Yes, so uh, we offer a wide range of certifications and attestation that cover uh, compliance programs from around the globe. You can leverage these certifications and attestations to meet additional compliance programs such as HITRUST, uh, CSF, uh, or other similar programs. So um, the, the short answer is that you, we will help you build that. And, and so the, the relevant question really here, here is, um, is, can I attain HITRA certification on AWS? And the answer is yes. Okay, uh, next question. Um, hello, please can you explain how you deal with the pushback coming from the team in charge of production when you inform them that you want to secure legacy apps with RASP, considering that those applications are running fine and adding RASP might be seen by production as a risk uh, of interruption of services to those applications. Chris, I don't know if you want to start with that, and Sarag, you probably got some Yeah, absolutely. Comments. I can jump into that one for sure. So, yeah. And that is definitely a concern that a lot of teams have, and frankly, rightfully so, especially when we start talking about agents and adding anything to you know, an environment that is working functionally um, and maybe is kind of held together by um, you know, duct tape and bubble gum, right? Um, what the key factor here to do is to actually work side by side with the production team or the operations team and install the agents and, and get the pieces running in a non-dev environment and truly work with them to show them the impact to the environment, which is very minimal, uh, and then work through the process uh, you know, to, to prove out any of their concerns. That's a big shift, I think, in a lot of the, the new conversations with DevOps and some of these other pieces is making sure that it's not any of this over-the-wall type of conversation, but yet that the security folks are embedded with them and, and take the concerns uh, into the conversation and then prove that out, right? Show that this is, here's a specific impact in under milliseconds for any of the communications. Uh, and then the other piece of that is uh, being able to have both your uh, monitor and block modes in the protect environment. So... We've had uh, teams who have not been very comfortable uh, wanting to go to a block mode just because of some past, uh, past issues they've had with uh, traditional firewalls, uh, web application firewalls, excuse me. But by putting it into a monitor mode for them uh, and just uh, monitoring all of the traffic or 
excuse me, all of the application data flows with them uh, and in tandem with them, uh, we've been able to get folks to uh, seamlessly move over to the block mode once they have that visibility and have that comfort. Yeah, and I think I, I would just add to Chris's response. Uh, this is Sarag. Uh, you know, what we've seen with many of our other customers is exactly what Chris just stated, right? M many of them will, although um, they, it's, it's very fair and reasonable, of course, to get the feedback from the production teams of, of adding something to a legacy application that's running just fine. Typically, what they'll try and do is they'll just, you know, make sure it's working in some kind of pre-production environment, same exact um, application, same exact um, agent being embedded. Uh, and, then, and then they also consider the notion of uh, blocking versus just visibility mode. And, and, and both are, are we, ways to mitigate some risk. And I think what, what most customers find is that, you know, if there is some concern or if there is some issue, they will identify that, you know, before the application is even up and running. Um, but once it's up and running, they, they typically won't see anything um, that, that will cause it to behave abnormally. Okay, let me check for any more questions. Uh... Well, it looks like it. that's it. Well, thanks to all those that attended and thanks to our speakers. We hope that you enjoyed the webinar. A note recorded version of the webinar will be available shortly after the conclusion of this particular webinar at the same URL that I hope that you can share with uh, friends and colleagues. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.